A warm welcome to one and all. Myself, Om Vishwakarma, and my colleague Lakshmi Vishwakarma, second year BR students of Shrimati K L Tiwari College of Architecture, takes this opportunity to introduce you to our organization and institution. I now hand it over to Lakshmi to introduce our organization. Sahul Education, the parent organization covering five registered educational societies, is a reputed quality education provider. It comprises 62 institutions spread across Thane and Palghar district of Maharashtra and Chandigarh district of Uttar Pradesh. The blessings of our founder, Chairman Sir Honorable Shri Lagan Tiwari ji, and under eminent leadership of Group Secretary Mr. Shri Rahul Tiwari ji, and Joint Secretary Madam Shri Mati Krishna Tiwari ji, and Shri Uttar Tiwari ji, Rahul Education is diligently providing 360 degree quality education in many higher education fields. Rahul Education. Shri Mati K L Tiwari College of Architecture, situated in Mira Road, was established in 2016. S P R T C O A, along with its team of expert faculty, along uh, follows an experiential learning philosophy and has been collaborating with architectural firms, experts, and scholars to give holistic educational learning to its students. Our talk series Rubaru explores various aspects of architectural subjects with critical conscious learning and fact-finding methodology. And I'm pretty sure that it will be a passionate and thrilling ride of historic session, getting you all to travel you to our old historic time virtually. So, without any further delay, let's get to know to our today's speaker of this session, which will be introduced by Om. Let us begin with our session today on the subject of humanities topic: medieval art, a halo in the dark times. Speaker for the day is Professor Manasi Chokshi, ma'am. Manasi, ma'am, is passionate about history, teachings. Heritage, mythologies, architecture, and research. She has a master's degree in theory and design from CEPT University. Currently an academician, she is also pursuing a diploma in Indian aesthetics from Mumbai University. Manasi Ma'am also has a postgraduate diploma in cooperative mythologies, having contributed to veteran architecture and teacher Kul Bhushan's Jain book on education in architecture, titled Learning Architecture. She has also been a contributor and writer for the People Place Project book since 2016. Combining her passion from history teachings and mythology, Manasi Ma'am has delivered a talk title, "Mythologies in Temple," for the Council of Architecture Teachers Training Program in 2020, offered by the IES College of Architecture. Her research, the study of the interrelationship between spaces and stories. Case of Minakshi Temple, Madurai, has been published in an IGER special issue by MIT Pune. Manasi Ma'am also bagged the Best Teacher Award in Humanities category 2019 from Maharashtra Association for School of Architecture. After this session, we will be having a separate Q&A time for you all. So by the time you all can type your questions, queries, amidst or after the speech box in the chat box. And now we welcome you, Professor Manasi Chokshi, ma'am, and request you to begin our first talk series of Rubaru. Hi. Um. By the way, my name is Manasi. I just spell it as M A N E S I. So, okay. um, and I've contributed to Kulbushan Jain's books, not Kulba Kulbushan. Uh. Okay. So, um, I will start my. Share screen. Uh, I am audible, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, you can see my uh, presentation. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, I'll minimize this little thing there. So. Yeah. Uh, I can start, right? Any? Yes, ma'am. Yes, we can ma start. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you, and um, very thankful for that uh, nice introduction. And I'm very thankful to. Tiwari College of Architecture for having me here as a guest lecturer. Um, just to make it a little clear, I am not uh, really an expert at this because um, it's medieval art in Europe, and um, I am actually more of 
somebody who loves Indian history and Indian architecture, but I love history of architecture in general. And um, I also do teach uh, second year humanities in my college. I am a full-time faculty at IES College of Architecture. And um, uh, this has been my uh, um, pursuit to learn more about uh, 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 European history and art and all of that since quite some time now. Uh, so yeah, um, well, I label this as uh, a halo in the dark times is because um, the Middle Ages in Europe, in fact, the 50% uh, of your second year syllabus uh, belongs to what is very popularly called as the Dark Ages. Uh, a lot of popular art also, if you all see, if you Google up Dark Ages, a lot of dark and uh, spooky and, you know, horror kind of things uh, come in front of you. But it is, a, so it is a very, very popular notion that medieval times, medieval art was very dark. It was very dull. It was all about death. It was all about horror. It was all about ghosts. Um, I'm sort of here to uh, break that idea. Um, I have tried my best to not talk about architecture directly. But uh, I am also assuming that a couple of things you guys might be knowing. Uh, I will try my best to also introduce you to these words and these timelines. If somewhere I feel that you all might not know this or you might not remember this, because I understand you all are, uh, you all are just in the second year of architecture. So it's, it's possible that you don't remember certain things. You don't recollect certain lectures. Um, the purpose of calling it as a halo in dark times is because the art behaved like that little small halo in the dark times. So um, yes, the times were bad, they were difficult, but the art sort of gave people a push to continue living their lives. Uh, it gave them hope. And all of that is based on uh, that one religion that you all have been studying since the beginning of this semester, which is Christianity. Um, now, when I talk about Christian art, what are the what are the things that come to your head? Is <coughs> I'm sorry, I, I'm not been keeping very well, so I just might be coughing in the middle intermittently. So you have to sort of bear with that. So uh, when I speak about Christian art, what comes in front of our, our eyes is perhaps a bell tower. <coughs> sorry, ringing bells in the church or uh, a cross, a crucified Jesus, um, maybe some sort of stained glass paintings. Um, if you all have learned the architecture bit before, maybe some sort of churches might come into your head. Uh, I am again talking from a very uh, Indian perspective as to for us, what is Christian art? The cross is primarily what we think of. But uh, today I'm going to start the presentation with certain symbols certain kind of imagery, which will uh, sort of, uh, you'll wonder whether this is really Christian art or was it something else? Um, so this is the first, uh, also the presentation is primarily a lot of images. Uh, I, I want you guys to at least observe or at least think of what is it that these images remind you of? or um, you know, have certain sort of reactions. Even if they don't, it's fine. You don't have to worry about it at all. Um, just, just, just be with me with the presentation. There's, I don't think there's any need to take notes and stuff like that also. You can just look at the presentation because there is a lot that you will learn by just simple observations. So um, what is it in front of our screen is, uh, I mean, I don't know if y'all have read or, or if anybody knows this, but uh, this is actually called as a rotus square or even a sator square, sator square. So what is the peculiarity of this? It's S-A-T-O-R. It is S-A-T-O-R. It is R-O-T-A-S. It is R-O-T-A-S. Um, the same, there are five words and they are all arranged in a certain way that read the same word in you know in two directions uh, and then they are the reverse so they are like um, so what are they uh, so these kind of tablets are found um, 
in the excavation of the Pompey civilization, which was in Rome. Uh, it's found in and around uh, areas of Rome. It's found in present day Syria. So a lot of people were wondering, uh, researchers are wondering, were wondering, archaeologists were wondering, what were these? And did it have anything to do with Christianity? Uh, did it have anything to do with the classical empire, um, classical art? Classical art is always Roman Greek. Okay, classical is something. The word classical simply in English means something that never goes out of style, or something that is an evergreen style or an evergreen thing. That's called as a classic. Uh, so the classical civilization, anybody says to you any time in the world, it means it's the Rome and the Greek civilizations or the Hellenistic Empire, as it is also called. So they were wondering, what is this tablet? What does it mean? What do these words mean? Um, there are some more images. So sometimes they were also painted on entrance of the doors. Uh, as I said, so it's SAT or ROTS. Then there is Aripo, which reads opera the other way around. And tenet also reads as tenet the other way around. So um, you all understand the word palindrome. Uh, palindromes are uh, like the name Nitin, N-I-T-I-N. It reads Nitin both ways. Or the, the term Malayalam, it reads both ways the same thing. So this was like a, uh, like a, you know, a mix of palindromic words. And, you know, there were these letters who were, that were doing this kind of a play. Or were they anagrams? What are anagrams? Anagrams means um, all of these letters might be rearranged into some more meaningful words. Um, some more examples of how it was found in different uh, uh, mediums. So the first one was a tablet. The second one was like something that was painted on the door. This is something that is sort of chiseled on the wall. Now, one person sort of or a set of researchers they reorganized these four words, three words actually, into this kind of an anagram and they rearranged it as it read as pater noster. So it reads as P-A-T-E-R noster and P-A-T-E-R noster this way. And they were left with A and O as the letters and they're sort of arranged this way. So um, of course it's a theory. Uh, we are not 100% sure whether this was that, but it is said that this was a Christian. This is something that was very, very Christian. And if you were a Christian in those Pompey times, in those early Christian days, after, after Jesus Christ died, you would put this symbol outside your house or the rotus square. And why would you do that? Because Peter Nostor meant our father in Latin. And the remainder letters, A and O, they mean the alpha and the omega. The alpha is the first letter and the omega is the last Greek letter in, in, the, in the Greek alphabet. So it also has this um, Christian saying that uh, everything begins with me and ends with me. So, you know, it's A and O is alpha and omega sort of in this kind of a pattern. Now... Why certain things are depicted in certain ways and what sort of symbolism and iconic, like we cannot keep questioning the why. This is sort of somebody has come up with this theory and, you know, we're sort of saying, ki, yes, it must have been perhaps a Christian, rep a representation of a Christian symbol. Uh, symbolism is also an early expression of an attempt to do some sort of art. Uh, one more symbol. Uh, this Maybe, uh, maybe this is still there, okay? This, this symbol, the X and P, it's also called as the key row symbol. So key is key and row are the first two letters of the word Christ, and it's expressed in Greek. Uh, so the X and P is like key and row of Greek. And again, the alpha and the omega sort of features here. Now, uh, this also the X. The fact that the X becomes a plus when you rotate it is something that has lived on so far. So we still uh, 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 connect the X to Christianity, the, the plus to Christianity. We still sometimes, uh, a lot of times, refer to Christmas also as Xmas. Uh, so it sort of has this, uh, you know, lived on. The symbol has kind of lived on. And uh, this was something like, it was like a monogram which was found in the plaque of a sarcophagus around 4th century CE. Uh, sarcophagus is nothing, but it's like a 
coffin in which the body is uh, uh, buried in. Um, yeah, these are some more symbols. So um, the anchor, uh, the anchor of the ship, like how you draw it, that too became a, a very important Christian symbol in the in those early Christian days, or it's also called as Paleo Christian days. Um, so that was again to do with X and P, and you always had this little uh, circle on top which signified the halo uh, behind uh, Jesus Christ, and the fish were mere representatives of the people. So the people are following the the uh, the Christ, and you know uh, Jesus is like the anchor in their lives. Um, the symbol of the peacock. Uh, the peacock also uh, in in the Roman belief, um, the ancient belief system, it was considered as a very auspicious kind of a bird because they believed that its flesh never rots. Um, it's sort of a mythological belief. So we don't. I mean, it's obviously not true, but um, that is why it was also an important symbol that is featured in a lot of Christian art. You also have symbols like the lamb. Um, you have a lot of um, this anchor, fish, the X, the P, um, a lot more. Um, I mean, whatever I've spoken spoken about so far, I mean, we'll, we'll see what more uh, uh, is there in the upcoming slides. Uh, now, you might just be wondering that I am just talking very, yes, uh, there is no base to this. Now, where is this found? And uh, where is, what exactly, where is this? Like you're just showing us symbols. So um, a lot of times art needs to get displayed or art needs to get expressed in a space. So that's where architecture plays a very important role. But for art to happen, you need spaces, even to practice art and even to express the art. And these kind of symbols and these kind of um, expressions are very, very widely found in catacombs of Rome. And there are, I think, some more catacombs in the world. But uh, the ones that I'm talking about right now are in the catacomb of Priscilla. It's, it's this region in Rome. Rome is a city in Italy. Italy is the country. And uh, it's actually, what is a catacomb? It's actually a communal burial place. So it was, it's also the, the meaning of the word also uh, implies means burial in the walls. So um, the Romans had this practice. I am mixing two things very, very uh, often, Roman and Christian. So I will speak about this, why I'm doing this, and it will become a little clear in, in the upcoming slides. So the Romans had this very wide practice of um, communal burial, and we would do this underground. And um, they would have these walls of uh, burial, uh, burial uh, slabs. And uh, Christianity was practiced here. Now, why was Christianity practiced here in a burial place, in a cemetery? Um, you, you might be wondering these things. So um, why catacombs and why symbolism? These are some two questions that I'm just going to address in this upcoming uh, slides. So this is a map of what the Roman Empire looked like uh, after Jesus died, like after 100 years, uh, 200 years of his death. And uh, it's, it's a massive empire. This is the Mediterranean. And um, all of these regions that are in red are, uh, um, are the Roman Empire. India is to the east of this map. It's not covered in this map. But just to get a reference to where and which part of the world this is, just giving you that map. Uh, this little thing that juts out is modern day Italy. And over here somewhere must be Rome. Uh, to make history interesting, you'll always have to take help of other subjects, of other streams. And you have to find what interests you from all these other things to make history interesting for yourself. A lot of times I, I come across students who sort of fall asleep in class, who say, I don't like history at all. It's the most boring thing in the world. But um, if you find the right tools, if you find the right kind of um, uh, references to look at, it will become extremely interesting. So uh, this is the map uh, that Roman Empire was under. 
yes these these times are labeled as dark times because there was a lot of things that was happening together there was a plague uh, a similar pandemic sort of a plague that you know affected rome from 249 to 262 um uh, there were multiple barbaric invasions barbaric invasions are nothing but uh, um tribes from the northern part of europe all of these upper regions of europe they were sort of trying to uh, you know invade and take over this more affluent region that italy and uh, all of these regions were they were trying to attack it over and over again and um, because of which there was a constant state of war that was going on now because of the pandemic a lot of the army the roman army had weakened they were really struggling to look for you know um, food and medicine and things like that so defense system was on a major low um roman empire itself had a lot of internal corruptions so that too was not a very strong government per se and because of all these reasons it eventually saw a fall in the empire like um uh, there were a lot of these emperors who were trying to you know the, the royalty and all of that they were trying to get hold of the throne and through a lot of weird you know un, unjust means and things like that now in such disturbing times people found their peace and their solace in christianity they felt that this new religion will help them come out of their state of um downfall and the state of um, the depression that they were in but this was also the time when whoever the roman emperor was was not really for this sort of a worship romans were originally uh, a polytheistic religion polytheistic means they have multiple gods like how in indians we have multiple gods the roman the greeks always had this pantheon of gods so you have Z- uh, the greek god is called the zeus and you have athena and, and you know uh, the greek uh, the romans borrowed a lot from the greek mythology so they just sort of changed their names and the characteristics sort of remained the same so roman gods were jupiter and apollo and you know things like that so they were not really for trying out this new religion and whoever was uh, following it was sort of getting persecuted so was was crucified and thus christianity had to be practiced underground they had to uh, have secret societies they had to have secret meetings secret prayer sessions and thus the art also followed where these christians were practicing their religion now uh unlike hinduism christianity and islam they are religions that need to be practiced in a group um in the sense in an assembly so when you go to a temple you can go alone and you can pray and you can come home but when you go to a, a church or a mosque uh they have prayer times they have the namaz timings or they have the mass timings so you really need space uh where people can assemble and pray together so the early uh churches or chapels or whatever you want to call them places of worship for christians were catacombs where they could assemble in secrecy where people would not be knowing that they are following something and thus their art their symbolism was also very secret so only if you were a christian you would understand what that rotus square meant or what the fish meant <coughs> or what the key and the row symbol meant and that is why they took hold or they took um, the the help of uh, the the symbolism to sort of express now uh, within these catacombs it was not just the just the symbolism which was going on which was uh, dominant we also had some very naive and amateur kind of paintings that were happening in these areas so whenever an important person was buried in the catacomb they would make these kind of arched um, you know reverence in in reverence to them <coughs> and these were sort of then painted over and on uh can can somebody be on mute i can't hear hi okay so um 
whenever you see any art so far i've just shown you symbols so i don't expect you to be thinking but always think about what is it that gets represented in that art so even if you're looking at any uh, a painting what is the narrative of that painting narrative means it's a story and you are sort of stripping that story down to its basic data like its facts that's called that's the definition of a narrative so here if we look at the narrative of all of these different paintings see i understand that as indians we are not exposed to a lot of this western storytelling the western narratives but um, a lot of the data is definitely available so we can always be you know aware about what is going on so um, a lot of the narratives in christian uh, not a lot most of the christian narratives have their stories that belong to bible or they have a new old testament new testament and things like that and all of their initial expressions um sorry all of their expressions up till the gothic times were all religious uh for us you know for for all of us it gets bit very um different to understand difficult to understand how what is a religious narrative and what is a secular narrative so secular narrative is everything that is not religious means if you have shown somebody just going about in in the de their daily routine so if you look at some temple carvings of konark you have this one lady who's just going about her day you have carvings of that also but in cathedrals it was only to do with christianity there were no other stories there were no other narratives that were usually represented now this is a catacomb painting of a good shepherd and it's up, it's from the catacomb of priscilla and we see very very heavy greco roman art influence here greco roman art again classical art very realistic kind of paintings uh, these paintings are obviously very old and they're very worn out uh, so the 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 picture is not very clear but um, this is this is a lot of the analysis and some things are quite visible so what this person is wearing how this person is represented he's wearing the typical toga of a roman citizen with the footwear and um the the classical art also always has some natural motifs that are represented along with the main character that they're trying to show so you have the lamb and the goats and the creepers and birds and things like that um another narrative of um, moses so this he's also a, a a christian mythological character and um he's just doing some sort of it's sort of a panel of the that arch and the uh, narrative is still christian uh, very very christian but but the greco roman art influence continues uh, with their clothing and with the way they are drawn with the way they are painted another example with noah praying in the ark this story you all might be knowing noah's ark where uh, you know those every uh, a couple uh, of every species of animal was put into the boat and you know it's the it's the story of noah's ark and uh, it's part of the bible so um moving on so this this was what was early christian painting about what was the sculpting about so uh of course it was all about the burials and you know about how to uh, everything was happening underground so the rich christians the people who could afford they sort of commission these kind of sarcophagus is uh, to be carved and uh, extremely roman in nature uh, with the kind of dressing that the people are shown there is this tree and the snake and you know the proportions the scale of the people everything is absolutely roman in fact on the side panels i don't have the images uh, the narrative is of bacchus bacchus is a, is their god of uh, uh, i think spring or god of entertainment of some sort and uh, he he is his stories are featuring there so uh, yes people have adopted the christian uh, religion but you know you cannot really change a culture overnight adopting a religion is very different than adopting a culture is very different it takes time for people to uh, adapt to you know the culture of their religion so the romans already had a very heavy very strong culture and these guys were originally perhaps roman and they were just taking up christianity as a crutch to move on with their lives and um, another uh, carving that was uh, commissioned by another rich 
uh, Christian. And again, extremely Roman characteristics in his entire carving. If you literally have Corinthian columns here, you have pediments. The triangular motif is called the pediment. Uh, you have the entire entablature, the whole, you know, carved frieze and all of that. Uh, this is a Christian um, burial sarcophagus. Yes, the stories that are displayed in the front, they are all to do with uh, Jesus and his miracles and all of that. Um, so, um, some more questions now. Yeah, I am sort of, you know, I'm going to, uh, the, today's lecture, I'm almost covering like a thousand years. So we'll have to do a little bit of jump and, you know, it might feel like, oh, I was still looking and thinking about the sarcophagus and now something else has come. So um, uh, was Christianity still a secret? Uh, I think you all did a lecture in the past two weeks where uh, you all spoke of Byzantine and Constantinople and you all spoke about the Ottoman Empire and things like that. So was Christianity still a secret? Uh, was there a turn in events? Yes, we had um, Constantinople who took over the Roman Empire and he shifted the capital from Rome to Byzantium or present day Istanbul. And he was the first king who formalized Christianity in his kingdom. It means that it was no longer to be a secret. It was no longer dangerous to be a Christian. And this happened around, you know, 300 AD. 300 years after Jesus died is when his religion actually started spreading and getting more acceptance uh, amongst the people. Um, it is also said that his mother was a very strong, devout Christian and, you know, in her honor, he sort of gave the people this freedom and liberty to follow the religion of their, their, uh, of their liking, which was Christianity. And with that, uh, a lot of building activities started happening. We know that Byzant Byzantium, Constantinople sort of commissioned building of churches. He built his, uh, he built uh, uh, his own capital also. They say that he laid the boundaries of his capital on his own, the whole battlement, in a sense, the whole fortification and everything was done by his own bare hands, apparently. Like he was there like in life to supervise. Now, when you have uh, such a strong emperor and strong um, acceptance of the religion, it is bound to, uh, you know, the art is bound to get expressed with that equal amount of force. Uh, mosaic. Now, uh, uh, you started, we started seeing mosaic in the early Christian churches or the Byzantine. This is actually around the same time like Byzantine architecture, but it's still, still the category, the style remains as an early Christian style. Um, around 4th century AD, this is the apse of a church uh, at Santa Costanza. It is in Italy, it's in Rome. And um, mosaic is basically art that is done with small chips of um, uh, uh, tiles or uh, stone. And uh, it is actually a very strong Roman art. The Romans would follow this to do patterns on their pavement. And uh, they, they had explored this art um, uh, not very widely, not as much the early Christian state, but they had explored this art form. And these people picked that art and they started doing it along the apses. I hope you'll understand what the apse is. It's the end where the cross is kept usually. In any church, The uh, it's always like a round uh, in plan. It's like a semicircle in plan. And that's where the crucified uh, Jesus is usually, uh, it's the altar sort of the church. And uh, the ceiling of the app started getting decorated with mosaic. Um, pretty much all, a lot of surfaces started getting decorated with mosaic. Um, this is another, it's an ambulatory path at the same, um, at the same, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention something here. Jesus is again, extremely uh, heavy classical influence. The expression, the way he is presented, um, represented with the toga, with the shoes, with that, uh, you know, that halo, and uh, even his disciples and saints, the background, uh, the way these creepers are done, extremely, extremely classical in nature, extremely Greco-Roman in nature, not very fine, but very crude, because it was an, an, a medium that these guys were also trying and trying to uh, do it at their best, and they were also pretty new at it. Um, uh, new at in, in the sense that the pavement patterns were not as detailed and as uh, refined as what they were wanting to do. Pavement patterns were perhaps just 
some sort of a geometric pattern, which was easier to do in mosaic and you know abstract designs. Uh, this is an ambulatory path in the in the church. An ambulatory path you have to do if you want to remember ever like what is it? If you keep forgetting, it's nothing but it's like a pradakshina path in what you call in in your Indian architecture. It's where you do the pradakshina. So it's exactly that even in the Christian uh, uh, terminology, it's something that you do the Pradakshina around. So in the initial uh, Christianity, you could actually go till the cross. It was something where the movement of people was more important, the way they would practice Christianity. Much later years in Gothic times is when, uh, you know, where the, I don't know if I'll have reached that stage, but where in the Gothic architecture, where the transept comes in the way, where the plus sign the, the horizontal part of the plus sign, the shorter side, is where it started getting very strictly divided as the priest part and the audience part. So the circumambulatory part or the ambulatory part is where you do the production. Huh? Uh, and that's where they started putting this kind of mosaic. And uh, again, very heavy influence of the classical art in terms of the motifs, in terms of the patterns, in terms of even the color, it was blue on white. Um, mosaic tiles. In fact, uh, I don't have a zoomed in photograph, but these are like cupids, these things, these little figures, you know, they are like uh, angels and cupids. I get a very Roman expression. Corinthian columns, uh, this church is actually like a circular in plan. It's not yet the basilica or it's not like um, the Hagia Sophia. It's the circular octagonal shaped church that we have. Um, another area in the same church with this little uh, Medallion, maybe it was in uh, reverence to one of the saints and disciples of Jesus. Uh, a lot of daily activities um, sometimes featured uh, because Christians believed that uh, even an act of your own job, you know, work is worship kind of a thing, an act of doing your daily activities is also service to God, as against the Roman beliefs. The Romans did not believe they were more of a luxurious kind of a civilization where they did not give a lot of importance to the daily activities and there was always the slaves and all of that for that. But the Christians had this whole idea of dignity of labor and everybody is equal in eyes of God. And a lot of times these little, little things featured as the background or as the borders. And um, then they started uh, um, further, uh, also started using gold as uh, an important element into their mosaic. So gold tiles. And uh, it was usually Jesus or the halo that was around him that was in the gold to give it an highlight, to give it importance. And our Kiro is back. So this Kiro is going to feature till, it features till today, the cross has become the plus. And uh, it still means the same thing for what, what, it, what it originated to mean. The symbolism is still there. It just has changed its direction a bit. But then that is what symbolism does. It, it also evolves sometimes, most of the times with times. And uh, the backdrop, it actually can be mistaken to be a Roman painting where you have those various sceneries that they would paint in you know, real life kind of imagery and things like that. Uh, so it's still very, very classical in nature. It's still not had early Christian art did not really have its own identity. It was constantly borrowing from the classical times. Uh, going a little step ahead, uh, around 6th, 7th to 6th to 7th century. So, so far I was talking about all of these things where Byzantine had just conquered uh, his empire converted them, I mean, I mean made, made uh, Christianity as its official religion. And then what happened after he sort of, you know, died and there were more emperors who came into the picture. Uh, this is a, um, this is an important example, I think it's called the Ravenna, uh, the San Vitale Ravenna. It's a, it's a cathedral in Ravenna uh, in Italy. And uh, this is like another step ahead of mosaic. All of this that you're seeing in front of you is mosaic. It's all done with those little, little chips of stone. And um, the people now, Christianity, the faith had gone so intrigued, it had gone so in depth of every if of its uh, people that they, they treated the church as the heaven. And um, that the people are the, you know, when, they, when you enter the church, it's like you will enter heaven. And uh, this is actually, this is a close up of this part, the next image. And we will again look at how symbolism has continued. 
um uh, before that i'll just give you all a little hint or a little uh, peek into sculpting and what kind of sculpting was or uh, was sort of going on so the last sculpting that we saw was at sarcophagus where you had those uh, roman the pediment and the corinthian columns and this is how it had now progressed very uh, uh, not a lot of um, uh, scope for the sculptors to do but wherever they they were doing they were doing a fabulous job and had a lot of this ottoman influence also and a lot of lace like carving was now coming up like very very minute fine carving so um very little is seen but it is very very exquisite kind of uh, carving and sculpting that these these people were now skilled in so that that red part i had indicated for that now if you see the corners of this uh, dome the, this roof this the ceiling uh, it has the symbols of the peacock we have a lamb in the center and we have your kiro um, symbols continuing at the columns i'm sure if we zoom in further we'll find a lot more symbols but these were the ones that were very evident and i thought i'll just highlight and how symbolism sort of has continued even after which was it was followed in around 3 ad and now it's after 3 century it is, it is still there it is enhanced in its own way but it is still there uh so justinian was also an emperor who who sort of uh, he was the one who commissioned the building of this church and uh, you have a panel that was dedicated to him so you always have these patrons um uh, even in indian architecture and art and sculptures you have these little panels that are dedicated to the patrons uh patrons are people who commission the art if they are not there if they are not going to pay or they are not going to fund it the art is not going to come into existence so they also hold an important uh, place in understanding the art and the narrative that the art sort of uh, reflects so this is one of the panels in the same church and uh, it's he and his retinue like his retinue of saints and soldiers and things like that now the the fun or the the i don't know i don't know if it's a funny element but it's a very uh, it's a little strange element in this painting is that they are so um, you know uh, they want to so desperately display their uh, skill that uh, you can see that he's almost stepping on to the feet of the soldiers um, that level of finesse has not yet come because they're still experimenting uh, now it is not a uh, very strongly classically influenced it is now starting to reflect what the byzantine court was like what were the riches like it was a pretty uh, stable empire it was a pretty um, uh, rich empire economically well doing it also uh, uh, istanbul current day istanbul is, is the eurasia so it's that part which connects europe and asia uh, land masses and it's very important geographically for trade and uh, very strategic sort of location <coughs> so that was one of the primary reasons also why constantinople chose that as his capital <coughs> another very important characteristic of this mosaic is the fact that there's this entire gold background the gold mosaic background which is uh, done to highlight the entire painting now we will keep seeing gold as a background till quite some time till till romanist times um it was a, it was also a very very um conscious effort it feels like that they did not want to show perspectives they did not want to show side faces it was always front face the uh, the tallest or the biggest element or the figure in the painting will determine the person's uh, you know uh, status in the society so if it is jesus he will be obviously the biggest element now he's the king so he has this halo also and he has this uh like different colored robes and he's the king so he's shown that way there is no perspective shown it's nothing to do with the front and back uh flat faces uh yes there still is this thing of light and shadow that they had picked from uh, the roman uh, art but there's nothing beyond that uh the kiro has has survived but it's now on the shield of the warrior so it's, this is the actual kiro the x and the p the uh, another panel where theodora uh, the empress uh, her panel is also there in the same church it's also done in mosaic and um, uh, it's more like you know they're shown this this is a very typical a very peculiar uh, 
movement that they have shown in this painting uh, in this mosaic uh, mural is also this fact that you know this person is sort of trying to uh, open the window uh, the curtain uh, also note there is not uh, the these murals they are very static they don't reflect any sort of movement they are just there they are they are just you know everybody is if they are looking at one direction they are all just looking in that one direction the faces are very solemn they are very say calm and almost you feel their sort of expression less but that was also very conscious uh, uh, you know thing that these artists were doing now uh illuminated manuscripts now uh, again i'm going to jump so i finished with this mural and we covered symbolism we saw carvings we saw paintings and we saw some mosaics we are going to look at something called as illuminated manuscripts this is not something uh, you'll find it in a lot of websites books but it's not something that uh, we discuss a lot in architecture per se because it's it's just books and how does that relate to us um uh, but they do because these are designed books uh, if if anybody has to ask you what is the history of a book it's actually it starts from here uh, so what are illuminated manuscripts illuminated manuscripts are nothing but graphical expressions of the bible or the old testaments the new testaments the scriptures the <coughs> the biblical scriptures the christian scriptures and uh, um, the, some sort of prayer books the uh, gospels and all of those things uh, the saints in these churches they try to illustrate them uh do remember the the most important body in the society back then was the church um the the people who were priests the people who were monks there were monasteries also that were getting built this is now progressing from the byzantine times so it's coming slowly towards the romanesque times which um which have a lot of um uh, church is becoming complexes complexes means uh, the church is no longer a stand alone basilica it now also had a bell tower it had a baptistery it had a cloister and it had a uh, scriptoriums scriptoriums is where the priests would sit and write these these scriptures so they would um, of whatever was oral they were sitting and writing there were also some some of in the later years they also tra started translating some of the other literature from other languages into the local languages now what is it that we need to notice here again there is a very strong image in front of you you have the script that is written in the plus in the cross uh, geometry you have four saints and all four saints have this halo you know behind them uh it is in golden ink this whole writing is done in golden ink and um these are what 30 cm tall so they are like an a4 sized um, manuscripts they are like uh, they are very important sort of documents because they've survived all these years and this is somewhere done in 11th century Uh, a lot of these things were going on so there are there are a variety like each region also sometimes even the regional uh, variations would be seen in these uh, uh, sort of books so um the century evangelist portrait of mark using a use of golden background see again as i said you will see this golden background a lot in the upcoming art in this you will now start seeing hints of architecture actually even in that mosaic mural with the theodora's retinue you could see the architecture of the palace of byzantine court and what were the riches like here too you can see uh, this monk's life what is the sort of uh, room that he's writing in he's shown that he's thinking and writing something and he's shown in this chair but there's no effort to get into the correct perspective and you know draw it in the realistic way it's it's just the expression was always to do with spirituality it was a very conscious effort to not have these kind of elements into it uh some more examples where a uh, system of writing it's not just you know you going from left to right left to right it's this whole column and how they were also embellishing it embellishing means decorating it like how you know as children we would do to these scrap books or you know how you would decorate your uh, diwali book or craft book or something but this was more to do with uh, the church 
books so gospels or book of hours or uh, if any of you are uh, catholics and if you visit the church or might be having the service books so all of these things were still commissioned for the church uh, by some rich christians or sometimes even the church would commission the making of this this was all done by hand it was the printing press was not yet invented and it was completely done by hand on um vellum or you know it's it's like animal skin um and uh, the the scribes were also matlab jis cheez se likhte ho that's called a scribe so that is uh, that was either in uh, goose quills or you know and the ink was made with with certain natural i think i have a slide which explains all that so again some more variations of what were the kind of graphics that they were using isn't this what we do when we make books when we make magazines we're still following this kind of a system of uh, you know having a, an image and then some part as text and some part is highlighted and um, there is a certain way that the paragraphing is done like in this uh, the cross thing there is a certain way that the par- characters are placed uh so this time onwards the calligraphy also became an important art form how they are also called as miniatures but they are not really minute they, i mean they are not like small like the indian miniatures they are like uh, almost 20 23 to 20 30 cm in height and um so yeah, i was talking about how these things were made uh, there were also a few uh, books or you know uh, compilations which were made for medicinal purposes like medicinal herbs or something you know where they would draw the sketches of, of what plant has what qualities uh, it's very easily available actually if you are just google it you all will also be able to see what i am trying to talk about but this is still talking about christianity the stories from christianity yeah this is what i was talking about where each region also had its own influence so if uh, sometimes if you, your region like you're more towards the uh, eastern part of the uh, byzantine empire which is more towards greece you would have a lot of the greek influence the way they would do their art um this was more towards spain i think uh, no background color yeah and uh, this was somewhere perhaps in italy um now what is the codex now why did i again why did i put this is because it talks about the whole science of how books were made or uh, so initially uh, in the classical times it was usually written on scroll of paper so you know those things that you pull out uh, it has two sticks at the end and then you have this long scroll of paper so if you were writing on it it was getting very difficult for people to for the paper for the person who was writing he had to constantly unscroll and you know uh sorry unscroll and scroll the the uh, scroll and write and read also so then they came up with this ingenious kind of a method back then it was ingenious today you don't feel anything about it because you know how books get bound you know how papers are cut and all of that but then they came up with uh, the system of you know creating columns in that so they took the scroll of paper they created uh, six columns and then they would fold those columns and then there was a system to read that scroll so they are called as these old books today are called as codex but the book back then was the codex what what they would call it as and this this is also one of the you know early medieval bookcase so this is part of one of those uh, book of hours or you know those bibles illustrated bibles where they're showing how this person is writing and he has these 10 books in the cabinet behind yeah so the ink was a mix of color white of zinc and gold and silver so also uh, they would have this special paper paper or a special medium on to which write on which is purple in color so purple was always the color of royalty so if a royal family is sort of sponsored or you know it's for the royal church the paper would be gold uh, purple and the ink would be gold um yeah so the credit to our modern books with illustrations binding of books that sees its origin in spreading of christianity in the medieval times or halo even today so yeah the 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 book got invented because of this whole thing of they wanted to spread christianity they wanted to record the bible they wanted to make sure that the religion reached to its people and that's why it was illustrated so it made certain things very clear to them now i also used this term in the initial part of 
the lecture barbarians you might have heard this several times and they were bad and they were this tribe and uh, you know they were um, they were very very uh, barbaric so uh, barbarism or barbaric actually comes from the greek word it just means ba 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 so ba 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 means something that they did not understand the word sort of has a roman origin um so any language for the romans in the roman empire times any language that they did not understand they called it a barbaric language and that's how the word sort of became polluted and it started getting a negative connotation that anything that's barbaric is alien is foreign and it is sort of unwanted um so those northern region tribes that i spoke about when i showed you all the map there were a lot of tribes that were trying to uh, migrate into these more affluent places uh, in fact i will suggest to all of you all one documentary at the end of this lecture give it a watch i mean it's a four part documentary each film is around 1 hour and in that he speaks about how these tribes were not as barbaric and as violent as um, the recorded history tells us so uh, the romans sort of so apne paas history kiske perspective se hai we have the perspective of the romans the the victorious people like the victorious the one who won the war the one the people who win they are the ones whose history sort of gets recorded so um the tribes that were we had the huns the vikings the goths and the vandals now the term vandal uh, it was a tribe but if you if you uh, look up a dictionary or google it vandalism is something that you do when you go and ruin something uh, purposely ruin something beautiful uh, purposely so we say na that apna heritage mein bahut vandalism karte they write that whatever you know they draw hearts and whatever, whatever. that's called vandalism but uh, this is how uh, words also have their etymologies and they also have their histories and how history can be made interesting even in language through language um so they say that these tribes were constantly trying to come in they were trying to migrate there was always this kind of movement of people that was going on do understand that the northern european regions they're very cold they're very harsh uh, they have a very harsh weather and um, the some i mean they they are just uh, deprived of all sorts of uh, even basic day to day things so they're obviously going to migrate to greener areas to better areas um and uh but these people also have a massive massive contribution to the art of this time so we had the huns who uh, are today i think the hungarians um the goths are also now when before coming into architecture if anybody told you gothic you would think of black and you would think of the punk and you know those black nail polish and the jewelry and black leather jacket that is also the pollution of the world in the sense that actually happened during the world war during his during hitler's time and it also happened one time before is when the renaissance movement started and they sort of degraded the gothic architecture because they said that it's not paper architecture and it's all a trial and error so it is all bad i mean it's you're not supposed to look up to it at all but the goths are a tribe and they were further divided as the sigots and ossi or uh, austeri goths the sigots means the goths who moved or migrated to west and the austeri goths were the ones who migrated to east after they came into italy now uh, in rome the emperors were so strong and they were so um uh even sometimes so lethargic that they were uh they were unable to fight these tribes yes they were violent in their own ways but they also had have had amazing amazing contribution to the kind of art that they produced so uh this is a this is a very typical hun hunish cauldron uh huns were the tribe from hung from the hungarian region and for for i think uh for a few years uh this hunish king attila also ruled over a major part of rome and he was also very um, rome i think or I, i might i might be wrong but he was one of those very um, uh, famous hunish kings and um, they have contributed a lot to the metal work so this is a bracelet this is a brooch it's also called a um, uh, fibula uh, fibula is like a brooch like you have a pin behind 
and uh, you have a lot of these variations in the upcoming slides also so you have gold and it is also said that um, these tribes would trade with with rome using the roman currency roman currency was in gold they would melt that currency and use that gold to make these kind of uh, ornaments and um, artifacts and things like that uh, a very recent um, example i can give you all in money heist uh, the recent season that was released um, uh, i don't know if all of you all have this connection but or if any of you all have seen the series but um, uh, berlin uh, um, steals this um, artifact from with his son in the recent season and those are viking um, gold artifacts so vikings were also a tribe and they also tried to um, attack rome several several times and you know they were always in that that flux of civil war was this um the visigothic crown and eagle motif fabulae when these are brooches uh, see the use of precious stone the way they have made these uh, artifacts so ornate and so beautiful um passive contribution might not be to a lot of architecture but definitely into art uh, eagle also was a very important um motif for these tribes uh, because he was the eagles are very strong and large birds and um, a lot of mythology is also related to eagles um so it's like a, an important religious uh, motif to these people another thing to keep in mind uh, is religious motif me cultural motif uh, to keep in mind is that these tribes were also christians they were because they were because there was this constant migration they had also converted themselves into christianity and that is why a lot of their motifs their contribution is also towards uh, these churches a lot of these things that are found uh, they are now in uh, important museums and um, treasuries and things like that but they are mostly found in the churches and the cathedrals of spain hungary and all these regions now um from romanesque to gothic so another thing i just wanted to i tell this to all my students is um this whole division of this is early christian this is byzantine this is romanesque this is gothic it's a very modern construct it is it is done so that historians can understand the movement the styles there is actually very blurred these boundaries are very blurred as to when romanesque ends and when gothic starts we cannot really say ki exactly this date this started and this date this ended uh, history doesn't work like that um another thing is that these uh, styles they kept influencing geographical regions so if there is a style that was started in rome in italy uh, it would if there were people traveling from there to france and all of that so a lot of that is why it's called the medieval art of the europe it's not just italy it's not just rome so you might find examples in spain you might find some examples in england so renaissance and all of these movements they even went up to england so why i'm saying went up because between the european plate the landmass england is on top it's towards the north and you have the sea in the middle so it literally takes time you know those times were not like you take a picture on uh, in your phone put it up on instagram and it becomes a trend it becomes viral like how like all those weird viral dance videos that people do it's not like that styles took trends took time to travel because uh, technology was not that advanced and people were still getting there so that is why i've uh this section is sort of romanesque towards gothic it's an in between stage um uh, again now this was uh the kind of paintings that they were still doing the romanesque paintings what happened with the romanesque architecture was that they picked the existing romanesque uh the roman basilica see after all of those catacomb kind of worship ended the uh, uh, byzantine uh, constantinople allowed christianity to get followed and that was in istanbul but what did people do they they also looked up uh, they also took up um, these uh, vacant spaces like the court rooms or the town halls of those roman places and they started converting those into churches initially and then when they thought of building new churches that was the only prototype that they had that was the only 
form that they knew. So they started replicating those basilicas. So if you look at the cross, in the top part, the apse part was where usually the judge would sit or the lawgiver would sit. And that got converted into where the Jesus is now. So, and, you know, certain changes obviously happened depending on what sort of things that they wanted. But the initial prototype was the Roman uh, basilicas or the Roman law uh, courthouses. And what did that do? It gave them uh, a lot of wall surfaces. It was semicircular arches. I'll not get into the whole construction system of that, but the Roman uh, basilica and the Romanist architecture gives you very lofty walls, um, load bearing walls. So you have a lot of wall surface. And because of that, they started doing a lot of these paintings. But the style has now evolved. You don't see any sort of classical influence. It is absolutely Christian art. It has its own identity. It has its own set of stylistic ideals. Stylistic means that they have rules. Like certain things have to be displayed, have to be expressed in a certain way. Uh, one of the major things that this style has is this very strong black outline each of these figures have. You will you'll always find that. Even this painting, you have, um, you know, it's very strong. The outline, how in, when you sketch something, how you do an outline, it's that. Again, this presence of golden background, uh, the colors, the alpha and the omega, see it's back, the symbolism is back, the alpha and the omega. And um, uh, depiction of architecture, uh, a lot of these words also that were painted here were also to do with the scriptures and things like that. An absolute neglect to perspective, see the book in his hand. Um, Jesus was always represented with a halo and a cross and, and sometimes even a circle on top of the cross. So that is the uh, symbol of how you represent Jesus. And all the other saintly people, they are always with a halo. So they don't have a cross, but they will always have that halo. So if you have a halo, you are this important holy person who might have uh, preached something or some sort of a saint. Um, a lot of Romanist frescoes, yeah, I forgot to mention this was a fresco. Fresco means painting that's done on wet plaster. Um, uh, but they are not a lot of this has remained uh, because of humidity, because of various other reasons. Fires, Romanist uh, churches were very largely destroyed because a lot of it was uh, made using timber trusses. So it was always very... Uh, uh, fire or prune and a lot of this art sort of got spoiled in that damaged in that and a lot of times it was just painted over and something else came over it so not a lot has survived but whatever has you and I mean I've put it in front of you there are of course a lot of examples um, as I said 1100,000 years of art you cannot put it in two hours of presentation it's just a lot to see through the illuminated manuscripts, that movement did not go out of vogue at all because people continued to go into the churches and it became more and more elaborate. So this is another page from the Winchester Bible painted around 1160 to 75. And now you can see how this too has its own identity, the strong use of color. You have this black outline. Uh, you have a certain way of showing things, um, no perspective. The bodies have become very slender. Even here, you can see they're very tall and slender bodies, very solemn, long faces and slender uh, proportions. Uh, architecture mildly getting reflected, seen, uh, presence of little bit of nature, uh, how the animals are shown. Now animals are not like decorative features, like how they were in that shepherd where there was this lamb here, there was this uh, another goat there. It is a part of the narrative. It is part of a painting. It makes, it has a story. It's not just something that they want to do. It has a meaning. Um, the sculpture, we did not talk about sculpture for a long time, um, but the sculpting uh, now was uh, uh, on the surfaces of the Romanesque, um, uh, Romanesque church. Uh, this element particularly is called as the tympanum. Uh, it's the circular part, which is, you know, you have the semicircular arch and the part that is, uh, you know, that, that covers this distance and you have the lintel here, this, this horizontal band is the lintel and this is, and this got extremely um, um, ornamented in the Romanist times and um, here you can see, so for sculpting, 
these artists had no real uh, reference to look at so what were, what art was getting practiced was mosaic murals uh maybe some gold work where there was this lattice kind of work the where we saw where we saw in those columns that was getting practice but sculpting has sort of taken a halt in in the middle um in those in between times that these guys had the reference of the illuminated manuscripts and you can see that kind of an influence here you have the slender proportions the human figures are very tall very solemn looking very as a calm and uh, the halo has taken a feature here and uh in sculptures as an art also you have a type so uh, a sculpture is a sculpture matlab the form when it is carved from all three sides from all or, or all five sides actually so our murtis uh, i think the best example i can give all of you all is our ganpati ka murti but that is like a molded thing you put it in a mold and whatever but that is like a it's it's three dimensional right the ganpati has a back and you can see his full mukut and from everywhere right only the base is flat but these are relief sculptures relief means the back will be flat it is just the front side which has the carving and um this this was the kind of art that was going on and this was a sculpting that they were doing again the theme continues to be religious there is no secular kind of uh, story is getting uh, reflected anywhere uh, this is an important example because uh, this column was also a feature of the romanesque architecture so you you would have these splayed openings s p l a y e d uh, it's a very very romanesque feature you have this arch ke piche arch ke piche arch you had these it was a load bearing system actually done for the structural uh, like the capacity to to be able to take the load of that it was sort of splayed and then you had this arch and the tympanum and you had a column there now this was just I mean probably done to take the load of this whole panel and to be able to assemble it and things like that but this column i think it's called the tomb row or the yeah tomb row and uh, that got very very ornamental in the in the in the when the styles sort of progressed um 11th century 1200 is also when gothic begins so that is why it's like roman is going into gothic i have not included uh, gothic uh, examples of sculpting here because um you will eventually i mean when you will come to gothic times you will automatically learn about it in your architecture itself because that line got so blurred as to what is the column and where is the sculpture it's it's very uh, it's sort of uh, it's there you will you'll have to learn it automatically so you had the gargoyles gargoyles are those uh, uh, those evil looking animals which are also acting as uh, storm water pipes uh, those are called the gargoyles yeah so sorry i was talking about this so this this image here is uh, is an uh, is a side image of this tomb row out here and uh, this is the panel that's happening in this tomb panel and uh, again that lintel is there and you have all of those you know i think there are apostles or saints and uh, relief the other side is flat it's not a complete 3d so uh, sculpting was taking this kind of a uh, movement in its in its progress uh, figures are again very long and very um so lame and very as a peaceful type of uh, figures you do have certain introductions of animals and you know these e so that is why the gothic um architecture or sculpting um uh, actually they were they belong to the gods the vesa gods and th those were the people who sort of initiated this whole gothic architecture and their original cultural beliefs had a lot of these um I forgot what they are called these uh you know combined kind of animals the head could be of the of a bird the body could be of the uh animal and things like that uh mumbai architecture is also called as bombay gothic but it's a more of a revival so it comes much later do not confuse ever gothic architecture with what is there in bombay because bombay architecture is done around 1700s and this gothic architecture is done around 11 1200 in france um i have included just a bit of uh, this um illustrated manuscripts again but see how it has evolved now now we see a little bit of an effort to start showing things a little more realistic uh 
the, there is we we see that they have started putting in an effort to show a little bit of perspective they are putting in an effort to do this like they want to do this now like it's it's like enough of you know reframing from perspective and enough of being uh, not showing the real type of things narratives continue to be religious this is a saint trying to cure somebody of i think uh, leprosy or plague i think um the society is very very clearly expressed in this again this is a this is this must be this high 27 to 30 centimeters uh, sometimes even smaller a5 size also they would have the prayer books and all uh, the feudal system was was very very persistent in this time um and uh, feudal system is like the zamindar system of india like similar system where you have the feudal lords and all of that and you had a very strong divide of the rich and poor and see how that is expressed see how the architecture is expressed so this is the kind of motifs that the architecture also was having like these kind of <coughs> pinnacles and towers and these motifs are very common in the gothic architecture i think you'll have yet to be introduced to that architecture style but you all will notice these things there um again some more examples one thing i sort of missed mentioning to you all is while they were doing these kind of um, calligraphy in the books this was all again hand done they started ornamenting these first letters the first letter of any sentence or the paragraph they would or they would really embellish it to such a look at this this is the first letter actually it's not a picture and they started uh, expressing it illustrating it in great detail and uh, um it's it's actually very it's it's very amazing to look at it also like this is like the first letter of that and um, see how the embellishment has sort of improvised it's become much more uh, elaborate uh yeah some more examples here yeah, they've literally put up the entire sketch of the the castle there and um, uh, yeah they also started including calendars calendars at the back of these books so the whole thing of months and days and things like that uh, certain more stories started getting featuring in these books we cannot not talk about stained glass artwork and uh, this was a massive contribution and it went through a lot of evolution when it started uh, from the gothic times so this is what exactly what i was saying that we also saw 11th century things which were you know um uh those books were also in 11th century but this was also going on this is saint denis cathedral and uh, they they installed this kind of uh, stained glass work uh in its apse and um this is the very initial part this is where gothic architecture actually began the style gothic actually began in this time and just the upcoming slides are just how it evolved so 11th century ke baad like your chartres cathedral which is 1250 ad and um actually i'll also share with you all one link where uh, it's shown how stained glass work is actually done so after you see that you'll realize that doing this is difficult it's not uh, it's not uh, something that you do in 5 minutes it's not like those camlin glass colors you have a glass and you just draw on outline no it's it's proper staining of the glass it requires heating in the kin and uh, it's an elaborate process basically but if we see how they have evolved now stained glass work has started to look like paintings and uh, these are actually done with small pieces it's like a mosaic but it's done with small pieces of glass and this whole uh, compilation or the whole composition is done on a separate thing and then it's brought together and then this panel is installed so gothic architecture was actually all about reducing the walls and so that is why we don't have a lot of wall painting in gothic architecture you have a lot of stained glass you have a lot of sculptures and that is why that painting activity was then reserved to those book of you know illustrations and illuminated those manuscripts but the stained glass work saw a massive evolution in those i think for five centuries so look at now it's like architecture ke andar architecture na you have a window and uske andar you're showing another this um, the saint and this whole uh, decorated kind of finish and all of that 
and there is shading also done in that you can it's you know when when you look at it it's not very evident that oh there is but when you just look at it very closely even each of her hair and I mean that fellows or that priest I don't know if it's a lady or a man but uska every hair is is a detail you can see it you can feel that it's there and that's also how it evolved so this is like around 14th century this is there of the uh, renaissance had already began in simultaneous times like in rome and this is the kind of gothic work gothic architecture um windows and stained glasses that they were doing so um yeah again you all can see here it's very very detailed and there's a lot of shading and things like that okay so um actually there is a lot that you can talk about medieval art is the time span when rome fell and then the time uh, till the time when rome uh, rose up again to its original glory so uh, actually there is nothing original in it but that's how the the renaissance has recorded these times and the part where it fell until the part where it grew back it's called the middle ages it's called the dark ages because rome was not its its amazing self and uh, a lot of other things were happening but these are not i feel that these are not very dark times uh, this is a lot of trial and error the entire gothic architecture the romanist the byzantine it was a lot of human effort it was a lot of uh, human involvement it was a lot of dedication that they wanted to do something for god um and it was a lot of uh, devotion to service to god so um we traveled almost a span of 1000 years through art we saw symbolism we saw the kiro and um those uh, rotus squares and 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 we came to this like wo symbolism kidder and look at what it is become now like i have not spoken about any of those arches or i mean that's an another uh, i mean when you speak about architecture it's also an art form and it opens thousand more doors that we can discuss about but um i have refrained of myself i could have even gone into the furniture bit because there was also even those tribal uh, metal work pieces that they had explored there are a lot of lot more uh, pieces in fact that money heist i i did not get a reference of that photograph of that you know that episode but the things that are shown in that that is also like amazing like how how intricately um how they have how they must have designed those things and um that is the that is the charm and the beauty of these times that it was just full of dedication and devotion and it was somewhere uh, to do with a lot of hope that there will be good days ahead um yeah the gothic times are when all the art forms took a conclusive position so yes during the gothic times things were improving there was a certain kind of stability that was coming in the society and that is also why the renaissance sort of followed so renaissance is like the revival and everything became uh, very realistic very humane very uh, human centric um and uh, there was change in all aspects of life like society science um, everything uh, religion also uh, when you will study your renaissance bit you will also realize that when you whenever you study whenever you have any speaker that comes for that you you should observe how the themes then change from christian narratives to greek and roman uh, narratives how uh, how even typology of buildings start changing so far i spoke only about churches right i showed you all art that was happening in a cathedral art that was happening in a church but in the renaissance time you will also learn about orphanages hospitals um churches of course but uh, urban squares um urban inserts city designs a lot of things started changing but it doesn't happen overnight my my problem with with students understanding history is they feel 1400 aa gaya na abhi sab change it's not like that it's not like there is a time ticking somewhere and there are a group of people who are thinking today i have to change now tomorrow onwards i'm going to do renaissance it's not like that uh it takes time for things to evolve it's not something that overnight somebody learns the skill to do realistic paintings or they learn the skill to do perspective it's always a generation uh, generations or you know hundreds and thousands of years that take art to come to a certain stage um yeah 
Okay, so um, yeah, so with that, I conclude my session. I think I, I sort of uh, uh, covered most of the points that I've written here. So yeah. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Are you all there? I, I don't know. I could not see anything because I... Hi. Hello. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I will Hi. be sharing with all of you all the links of whatever I, I was speaking about. And, you know, you all can then... Ma'am, uh, you can share those link with the uh, that activity uh, email, and we can share uh, all that with the students. Sure, I'll do yes. that. Yeah. Okay. Hello, uh, Om. Can I just uh, join in? Yes, ma'am. You can. Yeah. Hi, Mansi. Hi. Hi. Yeah, that was a wonderful session. I uh, tried my best to join in as soon as possible. Yeah, and uh, I think I could, uh, you know, uh, hear a majority of what you were trying to explain. So first yeah. of all, a huge thanks from uh, Tiwari College of Architecture that you being unwell, uh, you tried to make it, and you made it made it with a bang. So thank you, thanks. <laughs> thank you for uh, having was... me and even giving me this opportunity because um, it's it's very rare that you know. It, it, I mean, we are very young. So, I mean, I'm very young. So, people don't have such faith that somebody of my age will be able to speak on this. So, yeah, I'm thank very thankful to you for that. Are you're most welcome. You were wonderful. And moreover, I, uh, you know, I somewhere uh, totally trust when it comes to humanities, uh, specifically because there are very few who would choose humanities uh, as a subject to teach. Uh, and with uh, with people like you who have been learning further to understand more and more into the depths of it, I was so assured that, um, you know, you would uh, definitely be uh, the best yeah. when you are handling this session. And the passion was seen, Mansi, the, the passion was definitely seen. So, so basically the, the reason for, you know, bringing uh, faculties from all colleges together and the experts who were trying were trying to do some some sort of a research um, in in little fields was was where I wanted to give a different uh, uh, hello to humanities, <laughs> which you have definitely brought in. Right, right. Thanks. So thanks a lot. These are my second year students who are facing the screen for the first time. Okay. So they were you know really worried whether we'll be able to make it. But I said, uh, no, you have to, you know, start somewhere. Yeah. And uh, they are trying their best to learn uh, all these things yeah. uh, through these small mediums and, and platforms that we are giving them. Yeah. So, Mansi, thank you very much once again. Uh, I thank uh, IES College also. Uh, even uh, Nisha, who was uh, here, she was also associated with uh, Academy and she also had a wonderful session with us. So we are looking forward to more from you. Mansi, we will get back to you. We'll see how collaboration, collaboratively we can work out on these topics of humanities and other things. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot again. Uh, um, um, all over to you uh, for your uh, Thanksgiving session. Uh, the okay, the students have done a good job. Huh? I mean, because it was their first time, I could sort yeah. of feel their nervousness. So I understand <laughs> Uh, I teach I, I teach the junior years a lot more than hmm. the senior years, so I understand. And a few errors in there are, are okay. I corrected him also, so it's okay. Yeah, it's all casual. Right. It's fine. Yes, Om, you can continue. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Professor Manoj, Professor Manoj, Professor Manoj, for an enlightening and knowledge-giving presentation, which took us on the right way to get to know all the views of medieval art. And uh, yes, ma'am, uh, if anybody does have a question uh, for this such a great session, uh, they can type in the chat box or they can also email on the activity.sklcoa.gmail.com. So if uh, anybody does not have any questions regarding this session, uh, uh, heartiest thanks to all the participants for joining in for such a great session. Thank you.
Thank you so much all. Thank you, Mansi. Thank you. Yeah. I can we can leave this meeting or yes, I think we can, but uh, just to, uh, um, uh, the links that you were sharing, you can do it on the uh, email. How do you yeah. Ha, that will be great. Yeah, yeah. Be I'll great. do it on the email. Fine, fine. Okay, okay. Chalo. Okay. Bye bye then. Thank you Thanks. so much. Yeah. Bye, ma'am. Uh, Thank you. Where can I see this YouTube? Uh, this was live, right? This... Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll share the link with you. Fine, fine. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.